Let's jump into the message today. Uh, we're in week number three of our sermon series, Influencer. If you haven't been here yet for this sermon series, the, the goal is simple. The goal is to get you to be aware uh, of the opportunity for influence that you have. And it, it, is, it is a goal you should have if you're a follower of Christ. That, that's why you're on this, this earth is to be influential in other people's lives. I told you a few weeks ago, I said, what's core to this is influence is, is something you, you gain. It's not something you're given. You can get a title. You can get an inheritance. You can't be given influence. You, you gain it. So you remember two weeks ago, we talked about what? Integrity. Integrity is the foundation of influence because influence is all about trust. And when you, when you have integrity, the simplest definition of integrity is consistency. And consistency is something that buys you trust. And so if you want people to listen to what you say, you got to have, you got to have integrity. Last week we talked about relationships and I talked about being in relationship with people outside of the church. Remember I used the salt and light. I said, if you have too much salt, what happens? You die. I wanted you to remember that. Like if you remember nothing else, just remember you die, right? If you, if too much light, you get cancer, you die, right? It's the sunlight. And so the point is your salt and your light, those are elements of influence. God makes you that so that you can go into darkness and you can go into areas that need to be preserved or need to get the taste of God. And you can make a difference in those, in those areas. And so today I want to talk to you with the I word importance. And if I was really going to unpack the word importance, what I'm talking about is looking at somebody and, and, and through your life, through your investment, so maybe there's two I words, through your investment into their life, you, you, gain, you gain influence. Here's what I'm talking about. Maybe you're a person who's been coming to church and you are a remarried person, right? You've been through, you've been through a hellish marriage and you've been remarried and now your, your, your life is different. And if as somebody would look at you, it would appear like your life has always been put together, but you've been through some stuff in, in your life, and maybe at some point you've wondered why. And here's why you've been through some stuff and God has brought you out the other side because somebody else you're gonna come into contact with is currently going through what God has brought you through. And God wants you to not only pour into your life, he wants to pour through your life. Somebody in this place, you come from addiction. We have a lot of people that you've come from addiction, but you've not only been clean for a few days, you've been clean for years. Like you don't even have the urge anymore. You don't call yourself in recovery. You're a brand new creation. Like you're that far out of your recovery, right? But you meet somebody in your life that is new to their walk and they're struggling in their recovery and they're up and down and they're clean for a few days and then Satan brings them back and he convinces them that they could never change and they're struggling right now. And God's done something in your life because he wants you to pour your life out into them. Maybe you own a business. Any business owners in here? And many times in your business, you get into the understanding you're in competition with people. Like, that's what we do. I'm a pastor. I mean, just to be honest with you, pastors think this from time to time. Like, we, we want to hold what we have. We, we get in competition. We, we start to forget that these aren't our people. We all got reminded of that during COVID, by the way. When you take the crowd away from the pastor, all of a sudden, the motivation is revealed. And all of a sudden, you can, if you're a pastor or a business owner, God could be doing some great things in you. And it could be like, I want to keep it to myself and I want to hoard it and I want to hold it. But maybe God's calling you to resource and invest in another person that's locally near you. you, you you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna invest. The, the word I'm actually talking about is mentoring. M mentoring. And the word mentor actually comes from the, the old story, uh, the Homer's the Odyssey. You guys remember that? I don't, right? And so I'm just going to be honest with you. I think I skipped that part of school. Uh, but I remember the character's name because I saw the movie is Odysseus, right? Or that's how you pronounce it. I said it in th first or second. I looked at me like, is that how you say it? We don't know. Okay, good. And so, I don't know. I just read the Bible, right? And so, but Odysseus, I, I think that he was a part of the, the, the Trojan War and he was the warrior. And, and, and the story is about him making his way back to his family, right? And he trials and tribulations when he left to go to war he leaves a wife and a young young boy and when he leaves he has a friend his name's mentor in the story and mentor is left there a, a, as a as a resource for his young son because the dad is no longer there and what mentor does is he he, he serves as wisdom and encouragement for this boy as he's waiting for his father to return from this war and it's taken way too long and he's growing way too fast. And so mentor, if you read the story, he, he actually is used as, a, as, a, as, as wisdom for, for his, his child. 
So you get this name mentor, and now you have this thought, I need a, I need a mentor, I want to mentor somebody. And mentoring, at the simplest definition, is pouring yourself into another person. One person said, having a mentor is having a, a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push in the right direction. And here's why this is such an important part of the influencer series. We talked about integrity. We talked about being friends with people that are outside the church and influencing them way, that, that way. I, I did a study this week about the influential relationships you're going to have. And some of these won't surprise you. The most influential relationship you'll have on this side of eternity, if you're, if you're married, is going to be with your spouse. Did you guys know that? <laughs> you should, right? And so they influence everything. The second most influential relationship you'll have on this side of eternity is with your extended family, your, your parents, right? Good and bad, your siblings, your grandparents, right? Your, 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 your aunts and uncles, your cousins, your, your, your crazy aunt, uncle, you know what I'm talking about? Like they're going to they're gonna have influence in your life. You know what the third most influential relationship you'll ha- you can have on this side of eternity? The mentor relationship. When you pour yourself into the life of somebody else. T- to me, this is ridiculously important. That if God's doing something in you, he's not doing it in you just to keep filling you up, but he's doing something in you so that you can pour out into somebody else's life. He doesn't give you a testimony for yourself. He doesn't take you through trials for yourself. He doesn't give you talents for yourself. He doesn't give you success and wins for yourself. He gives you those so that you can be a resource to other people. In fact, I love love what some, some theologians, some famous people from past have said about giving to other people because I think it's so significant like uh saint francis of assisi right i I used to quote him a lot when i first started because i thought i sounded cool but i don't know anything about him and so but he says this he says he says for it is in giving that we receive i think that's so good it's in pouring out that you get uh winston churchill he says we make a living by what we get but we make a life by what we give this one man i never heard of him he won the nobel Peace prize so he had to be successful his name muhammad yunus and he said making money is happiness making other people happy investing in other people that's super happiness and the great theologian goldie hawn she said this she said giving back is as good for you as it is for those who are helping because giving gives you purpose when you take a purpose driven when, when you have a purpose driven life you become a happier person you pour out. Watch what, watch, what, watch what the Bible says in 1 John 3. He says, this is how you know what love is. What does it say? Jesus laid down his life. He poured out his life for us. We ought to lay down our life for others, for, brothers, for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, you can, you can take that so far. If anyone has resources, if anyone has successes, if, if anyone has past experiences, if anyone's been through anything in their life or they've walked through it and they see somebody in need, they see a brother or sister and they don't have pity on them. How can the love of God be in that person? He goes on to say this. He says, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. I'm going to lay down my, my life. And here's what's cool. I started studying the, the life of Christ this week, and I, I study him every week. I'm a pastor. And so, but I, I started really looking at this because I was like, Jesus is usually the perfect example of everything. And I started looking at his relationship with one of his disciples named Peter. Now, if you haven't been to church before, and you, uh, you tend to relate to certain people in scripture, I, I do at least. Like I don't, when I read John, and I, I know how he was, and I can picture like how he was with Jesus. Like, I just don't relate with the Apostle John. Like, I, when somebody that's a male calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? Like, I, to me, I'm like, that's just weird, right? Like, I get it, but like, that's just too sensitive for me, right? Like, and so I usually, I, I'm just being honest with you, right? Like, I usually write to Peter more. And Peter, Peter was a fisherman. And I, I, I know I don't give that impression off like I would. Like you would think, nah, you're a John dude, right? You got skinny jeans on. And, but like emotionally, I relate more to Peter. Peter was a fisherman. Peter had, you know, dirt up under his nails. Peter had a mullet, a mullet but not by choice, just simply because he didn't, couldn't afford a haircut, right? Like Peter, Peter probably smelled a little bit. Peter, Peter probably, his language was probably a little bit more raw than, 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 than most church people would like. He probably cursed like a sailor because he was a fisherman. P- Peter, was, Peter was my kind of guy. And I love to, to think about Peter because Peter always makes me feel better about myself. <laughs> just being honest. Like when you compare yourself to somebody, you never can, I'm not comparing myself to John, right? I'm comparing myself to Peter. Peter, and I, I, what, I, what I love about Peter is Jesus he, he, he sees something in Peter that everybody else didn't see. 
Like if you think about the life of, of Jesus and who he would have picked, you, you would probably think it wouldn't be Peter. It'd probably be John. And I want to show you this. I want to show you how Jesus mentors Peter because I think it's a perfect example of, okay, I'm going to pour my life. We should all, if you're here and Jesus has done something in your life, you should ask him, God, I want to pour this out. Maybe it's a mom in your neighborhood. She just had kids and you've had kids and it's, you've been pretty successful and you know, your kids aren't, they're alive still and you know she's struggling and you go, man, I'm going to pour my life out to, to this mom. Maybe you're a student and you're, 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 you've gained confidence through, through Jesus and you you go into the lunchroom and you see that that one kid that nobody talks to and they're sitting by themselves and you know they're kind of different and maybe they look different and maybe everybody else judges them and Jesus has done something you know if you're gonna pour yourself out into this person maybe it's a new it's a new worker somebody who's just starting and they don't think they can do it and you remember being there you're gonna pour yourself pour yourself out let me just give you a few thoughts uh, how Jesus mentored how Jesus mentored Peter number one is this is Jesus sees potential Jesus sees, he sees potential, right? You, you, ever, you ever buy, you ever buy a, a package of seeds, right? Start a garden. Anybody in here gardener? Some of you cheat. You just buy the plant, put it in. Amen. You lie. Like that's, if I garden, that's how I would do. In fact, if my type of garden is when I go to somebody's house and they ask me if, they, if I want some of their stuff, that's my kind of gardening. <laughs> I go to Produce Junction, something like that, right? Like I'm not a gardener. I actually have four boxes in my house that were there. I inherited them, and they grow weeds right now, right? Not weeds. And so anyway, I didn't say weeds. I said weeds. And so I just want to make sure. And they grow. I don't, I don't grow nothing. But when you buy a packet, right, if you, if you buy a packet, usually in the packet, what does it have? Does it have a plant? Come on, work with me. It has seeds. But on, on the, the cover of the, the plant patch or packet or pouch, whatever it is, do they have a picture of the seeds? They have a picture of the plant. See, the seed represents the potential in the picture. And oftentimes when we look at people, we judge people based on their seed state and not on what Jesus wants to do in their future. Because if, if you're garden like me, you're going to open up and be like, I'm going to Produce Junction. I am not taking the time to do that, right? I'm not watering it. I'm not investing in it. I'm not planting it. I'm not getting my fingernails dirty. I'm not doing that for a tomato. But some of you, you're like, no, no, no. Why do I do it? Because you see potential. If you're a business owner, most of the time when you started your business right from scratch, most of the time somebody didn't give you a custom business. Here it is. Most of the time that doesn't happen. When you start a church, nobody gives you a church already made. Here it is. Here's how it's going to look. Here's painted room. Here's kids ministry. Here's your core values. You know, here's this. Here's a band. You got to see potential. When we walked into this building seven years ago and we walked in, this room that you are currently sit seated in right now, if you're in Phoenixville, it was housed. It housed a bunch of old, ugly, dusty uh, Christmas decor, right? Prior use was one of those bounce houses where they used to have moon bounces and rock walls and kids would come in. So the smell, it smelled like Subway mixed with, with dirty socks, right? AKA my two boys' rooms, right? <laughs> and it housed old, ugly, old, ugly Christmas thing. And I didn't walk in and go, this is, this is hopeless. What did you walk in? You walked in, you went, oh, there's the stage. That's, that's where the band's going to play. That's where the moving lights are going to be. That's the seats. This place is going to be filled with life in a couple years. You got to see, you got to see potential. But so many times in our lives, we look at people and we see their seed state. They're not good. I, I do this with people. They're, they're, they're a pain in the butt. They're never going to change. They're never going to do this. They're always going to be that way. Nothing looks less like Jesus, by the way. So Jesus is different. Jesus didn't start a, 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 a zip recruiter page for him when he started to get disciples. He didn't send something out and saying, I need the best of the best. I need the educated. I need the brightest. I need the magna cum laude. I need all of those people. Nothing wrong with all of that. But if you notice the life of Jesus, he rarely picked those type of people. The Bible says he shows up and he, he sees Peter. And, and I, love, I love what he says when he first meets Peter. Watch what he says in, in John chapter 1. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, I found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him. And he saw something different. He says, you're Simon, 
son of John. He says, but now you'll be called Cephas, which means rock. Jesus said, you're Simon, but can you smell what I'm cooking? Come on. He says, you're, you're the... You're sea fish, which means rock. Everybody else looks at you and says, you're a fisherman. Which, by the way, is not something you attain to. It's something you go to when you're not good enough to do anything else in that culture. Nobody says, I want to be a fisherman or I want to be a shepherd, right? Everybody wanted to be a big wig in the religious circle. And so if he was fishing, that means he wasn't good enough to be a big wig in the religious circle. And here comes the savior of the world. And Jesus says, I want you. And I don't see Simon. I see a rock. I see something different in your life. You see, everybody needs three things to be successful in their life. The first thing, they need to dream. Second thing they need to do is they need to have a little bit of determination and grit. The third thing every person needs is someone who believes in them. Someone who comes in and says, you can do it. I know, I know you're not where you want to be, but turn around and look how far you've come. If you would just keep going, I think you could do it. I think you could have a good marriage. I think you could run that successful business. I think you could pastor that church. I think you could do the things that God has called you to do. You see, potential is often the bridge between where someone's at and where God wants to take them. And I started thinking about this in my own life because the truth is, when I was 21 years old, I had never preached in my life. I was in my third year of Bible college. I had never preached. I barely went to church. I spent more time in the donut shop than I did in chapel. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was not good at school. I was not good at theology. I was not good at Greek. I stayed away from Hebrew. I had no idea. Here I am, three years in, barely passing. What am I going to do? And I walked by a bulletin board one day. It was for job posting. This was pre-internet days. And I looked on the job thing, and it said, it said coach at a small Christian school. It didn't say all that, but it said coach at a Christian school in Seagullville, Texas. So I got on MapQuest, and I looked, <laughs> and I printed out the directions, and I drove to this little, this little church in Seagullville, Texas, and I walked in, and I met this pastor named Pastor Rogers. And he sat me down, and he looked at me, and he said, what is your interest? What are you going to school for? <laughs> I said, well, I really like donuts, <laughs> and I like sports. He said, we have a Christian school that has a flag football team. You know anything about football? No. But I like sports. And he said, we have a basketball team. I said, okay, now we're talking. He said, would you like to coach the sports teams? I said, yeah. And he said, you also have to be the janitor. So when you're done coaching, you got to stay out there and clean up. And I said, great. And he said, oh, by the way, you're going to get paid $150 a week. It's five days a week. I said, Okay. So I started driving there after school every day, and I would coach these kids in football, and, you know, our play was go long. <laughs> and I started driving them. He gave me the keys one time to a white church van, and he said, can you drive this thing? I said, yeah. I never drove a church van with 15 kids in it before. I'm driving in Dallas, Texas on four lanes of roads and the side roads. Have you ever been there? Everybody thinks they're a cowboy down there. Driving aggressively, I'm driving there, I'm taking the kids to the games, I'm staying afterwards, I'm cleaning this school, and then he starts to tell me, hey, you want to start helping around the church some more? I said, doing what? He said, well, we need somebody to invest into these kids' lives and teach Sunday school and do youth group, and can you do it? And I said, I guess. I never did it. I like sports. <laughs> and then he said, one night he said, hey, can you preach? I said, well, I'm going to school to be a preacher, but I've never done it. He said, next Sunday, you're preaching. I said, Sunday when? He said, next Sunday, Sunday night. Well, let's start there. That's when, that's when the scrubs start. <laughs> so I started on Sunday night, and I remember the very first sermon I ever preached. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I walked up. I'm like, I'm really going to get their attention. And I said, hey, I'm from, my name is Steve Dufresne. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I, I used to tell people I was from Philadelphia, even though I'm from Boyertown, because nobody knows where Boyertown's at or cares. <laughs> And I said, I got a few things that I know are in the Bible. The first thing is I know the Bible says that God doesn't hate, but I'm pretty sure that he, hate, he does hate the Dallas Cowboys. 
And I said, reason being because they suck. And then I went into my prayer. <laughs> no lie. Mike brought me to the office the next day. I thought my preaching career was done. He said two things. Don't ever preach in Dallas and say the Cowboys are hated by God. And don't ever use the word suck again in my pulpit. And oh, by the way, you're on again in a few weeks. And it was the first time that anybody in ministry, my mom and dad were in ministry, but they, they, they're your mom and dad. They have to like you. It was the first time that somebody believed in me. And if that little pastor, I remember I left after I graduated because he could only pay me $150 a week and I had to get a, a job at a, at a, at a, a full-time job. And so I went and got a job, but in tears on my graduation that he hugged me and he just said, I'm proud of you. And I just, I just remember that he, he saw something in me that I'm pretty sure nobody on my college campus, and I know for a fact that I didn't see in myself. And I'm just telling you, a great mentor, you look at, there's people in, in, your, in your sphere of influence right now that they don't see nothing good in themselves. All, all, they, all they think about, I can't do it. And you're going to come alongside them and say, hey, here, here's what I see. You know why I know that you can do this? Because God did it in me. See potential. Let me give you a few more, few more thoughts. Num number, number, number two, here's, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road if you're going to be a mentor. You've got to invest time. Here's the problem with so many of us. We don't have any time. Like I, last night, it was turn your, clocks, turn your clocks back, right? Like gain an hour of sleep. Isn't that the best, absolute best night of the year? Because you're like, I'm going to bed, but it's, it's nine, but it's only eight, right? And you get an hour actually, and I was getting ready for bed, and the weekend was over, and I knew Sunday was coming, and Sunday is, is a busy day for us, so we're getting up at five. And I looked at, I looked at Leah, I said, what did we do this weekend? She was like, what? I was like, what? I don't know what I did this weekend. And then I was like, oh, yeah, what I did is chauffeur my two boys around that are now teenagers all over the place Friday and Saturday, and now the weekend's over, and that's my role now. And I love it, but guess what I don't have anymore? Time. And we can use this. I don't have any time, so what do we do? We want to have drive-by kindness, right? And you might, if you have drive-by kindness or a, a, a drive-by generosity, you might change somebody's moment for a, for a day, but if you want to change somebody's life, you got to stop and invest time in them. You, you, got, you got to give them time in, in your life. And you see this in the life of Christ. You, you, one of my favorite stories with Peter and Jesus is when Jesus goes up on the, the mountain of transfiguration. It's one of the weirdest parts of scripture. But I want to show you something. I don't want to dig deep into the story. I want to show you what Peter says. The Bible says after six days in Matthew 17, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. He did this a lot. He had 12 disciples, but he took three strategically with him. He was going to build his church with all 12, but these were going to be the three leaders of it. And he led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as, as, as the light. Man, a light show. People say, why do you have so many lights? Mountain of transfiguration. And so just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah. Think about this. Jesus is there. Peter, the peon is there. And some heavy weights of the faith show up. They've been dead for years, by the way. Elijah and Moses. It's Elijah, Moses, and Jesus, and Peter. And Peter looks at Jesus, and he talks, right? Probably shouldn't say nothing in this moment. And he says this, and you can hear it in his voice. Lord, is it good for us to be here? <laughs> Am I supposed to be here? Like, a lot, one of these things is not like the other. And I started thinking about mentoring people, and this is essentially what you do. You invite people to the table where it's most of the time reserved for just your family, but you've made room for a stranger. I started thinking about my, my parents, because my parents are, were classic examples of this. Holiday would come around, we'd be sitting at the table, there'd be an extra spot. I'm like, oh, who's that for? They're like, Bob. Who's Bob? He's coming. You know, you go, actually, that, that's my seat. That's where I normally sit. You're going to go to the kids' table. Mom, I'm 25 years old. What can I say? <laughs> no, Bob's coming. Christmas is, it's like, well, my presence, Ryan's presence, George. <laughs> Who's George? Oh, uh, this is this kid we met, his parents, they, 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 you know, they, they're having problems, and he's been staying. He's going to come stay with us. I, I remember one time, I had two beds in my room, two twin-size beds. It's for sleepovers for me. I remember one time, this, this, this boy named Michael moved in. I just showed up, and he was there. 
And I'm like, he's Michael. He's like, he's your new brother. <laughs> and it was, just, oh, it was just always like that. There was nothing sacred in my house. Everything was an invitation to somebody else coming to the table of significance. That's how you mentor somebody. You, 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 you invest you invest time, you realize my family's not just my family. I have kids, my kids, and we're gonna invite other kids into our family. My marriage is not just my marriage. We're gonna invite other, other people into this relationship. We're gonna invest in other, other, other people. This holiday is not just my holiday. Matter of fact, it's not your holiday at all. It's Jesus' holiday. Let's remember that in a few months. It's about Jesus. We're gonna invite people into the sphere of significance in my family. You invest time. Let me just give you a few more thoughts that a great mentor does. A great mentor provides encouragement. You know the word encouragement, if you break it down, just means to impart courage into somebody. Every once in a while in, in somebody's life, you're going to have the opportunity to help them get up when they feel like laying down and keep going. You can do it. How do I know you can do it? Because I've done it. And the only way I've done it is through Christ. And if Christ can use me and work through me and get me through, he's going to get you through as well. And I'm going to walk with you every step of the way. You, you, you provide encouragement. And I love this. Like, this is my favorite part of the story of Peter and Jesus. Jesus was, he called Peter rock. I'm sure, I'm sure Peter got some slack for that. I'm sure Peter held on to that. I'm sure Peter went, went through his, his ups and downs of following Christ. That there was times he was like, dude, I'm not a rock. I'm soft. I'm, I'm, I'm messed up. I'm not, he's not going to build his church around me. He probably looked around, saw John. John's a better candidate for this. John ain't ever messing up. He's all sensitive. I just keep putting my foot in my mouth and I keep messing up. And Jesus sees something in me I don't see in myself. And Jesus is inviting me to the mountain of transfiguration. And I don't think I was supposed to be there in my life. And he's Jesus, this one moment, I, I love it. I love, I love the whole story of it. The Bible says Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. By, by the way, if you don't know uh, geography and, and, and that part of the Bible, you, this, this, this will be lost on you. But what was really interesting about this is Jesus takes them to a place where good Jewish people don't go. Like if you're a Jewish person, you're trying to keep God happy with you, you don't go to Caesarea Philippi. Why? Because bad things happen there. So if you think about it, Jesus is going there because that's where he's going to reach people. And he's going to reach people with people who remember what it feels like to be that way, which is why he called Peter. He, he's not going to reach religious people, right? Because oftentimes religion gets in the way of a relationship with God. You have him here, but you don't have him here. He's going to reach broken people. He's going to be a friend to sinners. He's going to be a person who goes into a, a, a cemetery and, and reaches and changes a person who's been cutting themselves and is running around demon-possessed. He's going to reach those kind of people. And if he's going to reach those kind of people, he needs dudes like Peter. He, he, he needs people like Peter. So the Bible says he gets to Caesarea Philippi, and uh, he asks the disciples, who do people say I am? That's a loaded question, Jesus. So they take the safe route. Some of them say John the Baptist. Some of you say you're Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter being Peter, he, he was never quiet. He says, you're Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And I love what Peter, Peter what happens to Peter in the next thing. Because, because for Peter to do what he's supposed to do, it's going to take courage that he doesn't have. You, you build courage through encouragement. So some of you, you're like, how can, I, how can I become the person that I'm supposed to be? And your head is filled with lies and, and shameful thoughts. And the Bible says, as you think, so you become. So that's what the Bible says, to renew your mind with the word of God. So Peter would often go back to the words of Christ, I believe, even after Jesus, Jesus left and went back to heaven. And remember this moment. Jesus looks at him and he says, blessed are you. Bl blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by your flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. In other words, he was saying, the anointing of the Father is beginning to work in your life. 
You're beginning to, to have thoughts and words that are outside of yourself, right? And then he says, and I tell you that you're Peter. He says it again. And on this rock, what does he say? I'm going to build my church. You, you are good enough for me to build my church around. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he, I love this. He says, and I'll give you the keys. <laughs> what? I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose. He confirms his calling. He entrusts him with the keys to the kingdom. He says, your words are going to be powerful. You talk about courage to Peter when he then goes into his full calling after Jesus leaves, and he's called to lead the church in Jerusalem, and he's still going through ups and downs and mistakes and flaws and all these other things. He's going to go back to the words of Christ. It was filled his life with the courage through encouragement. And the last one is this. I love, I love this because I think sometimes we need this. I know I do. But a great mentor is patient. Jesus sees Peter as a work in progress, not a finished product. And, and just for, for my own sake, this week I was like, I wonder how many times Peter messed up in the Bible. Like how many times did he screw up? right? Just for my own sake. And here's what's interesting. I was reading the Gospels, and at the end of one of the Gospels, I forget which one it was, it was like, uh, this is all we have time to share. That's how the writer ends it. If I had more time, I would tell you more, but if I kept writing, this book would never end. So we know that Peter probably showed off and showed out in his shortcomings more often than what we know, but just in the documented uh, moments in Scripture, there's 13 times where Peter, Peter messes up. Like one time, they bring, somebody brings a kid to, to Jesus, and Peter tries to shoo the kid away, and Jesus says, this is what I'm here for, the kids. A, a, another time, Jesus is, is walking on water, and Peter says, call me out, and I'll walk on the water. And he gets out, and he walks, and then he gets scared because he realizes he's on the water. He starts to sink. He fails. Messes up. There, there's another time where he talks when on, on the mountain of transfiguration. There's just times you probably shouldn't talk, and he just talks. One of my favorite moments of failure in his life is when Jesus is talking about going to the cross and Peter tries to talk him out of it and Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's a mess up. Maybe, maybe one of the best moments is when, uh, when Jesus goes, get ready to go to the cross and he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he, he asks Peter and James and John to come pray with him because he's stressed out and he needs his friends. And Jesus is, is, is so stressed out, the Bible says that he's sweating drops of blood. Scientifically, they've proved you can be in the state of anxiety uh, to the point where you will literally sweat drops of blood. This is how stressed out he is. And he asks Peter to pray for him, and he gets up to go find Peter. Peter's sleeping. <laughs> I mean, heartbreaking moment, right? And then at the Last Supper, he tells Peter, hey, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said he's not. And then before he denies him, he cuts a dude's ear off for good measure. Jesus says, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Puts it back on. Peter runs away and denies him three times. Gets even worse. The Bible says, he hears Jesus came back from the dead. He goes to the tomb and try to find him. He's not there. He's terrified because he knows Jesus is probably back from the dead and he's going to find out he denied him three times. He goes back to fishing. That's what he did. He didn't know what else to do. There is not a possibility that God could ever use me. I've let him down. He's given me time and time and time again. He goes back fishing. Jesus shows up on the beach. You ever have one of those moments where you don't want to be there? Jesus is on the beach. Hey, Peter, come in. Peter's far out. He's like, I'm not doing, no, no, no. But he knows if I don't come out, Jesus is going to walk on water to get me. <laughs> so I'm going to come in. So in shame, probably in fear, probably in worry, probably thinking that Jesus was going to be done with him. I mean, I told you you were going to deny me, and you still did. The Bible says Jesus makes a fire. They eat some fish. Such a cool moment. And he looks at Peter. He says, Peter, do you, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. He says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. One more time. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. P Peter starts to get mad, but he's probably missing the point. Peter had denied Jesus three times, had failed Jesus over and over and over again. And for every failure that he had, God, God was showing him through Jesus his patience. 
his kindness, his enduring love for him. In fact, a part of the story that I've missed my entire life up to this week, in the Last Supper, he tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And there's this little section in verse number 32 that he looks at Peter and he says, you're going to deny me three times. You've messed up a lot of times. He says, but when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. In other words, what he was saying is, you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up again, but it's going to be okay. You're going to come back and we're going to be good. And when we're good and you experience a grace that you've never experienced and a forgiveness that you don't deserve, go strengthen the church with it. Because you're Peter. You're the rock. I'm going to build the church with you. I see your potential. I'll invest my, my time, encourage you, and be patient with you. That's what it looks like to mentor somebody. Would you stand to your feet all over this house? And would you do me a favor, bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're in Montgomeryville, would you do the same thing? Pour your life out for somebody else. I promise you, that's where you'll find it. If you're an older couple, find a younger couple. Pour your life out. If you're a successful business person, find somebody who's just coming up. Pour your life out. If you're a teenager and you're in high school, find a middle school kid. Pour your life out. If you're older and you have time, go to a ministry. Tutor a kid. Join big brothers, big sisters. Foster somebody. Adopt somebody into your family. Make room at your table. Maybe there's a neighbor in your, in your, in your, your neighborhood right now that you know, man, their, their life has been, been hard. Invite them to the table of significance in your life. Use your life, what God has given you, and pour it out to other people. And I, I just... Maybe as I'm talking and I'm talking to Christians, man, you can relate to that, that Peter and Jesus relationship. Maybe, maybe you can relate to Peter like I can. Maybe it feels like nobody sees the potential in you. Maybe it feels like you're not worth the time. Maybe you're, you're convinced through discouragement of thought and even words that have been said to you that you're not worth it. And nobody cares about you. Nobody sees you. Your life is useless. Your mistakes are too much. Your baggage is too heavy. And time's out. You've made too big of a mistake. You know what I love about the story of, of Jesus and Peter? Is it tells us, if you just give him time in your life, if you would just open up your heart to him again, You'll hear kindness, you'll hear love, you'll receive grace, you'll receive mercy. I've always thought about Judas and Peter at the end of their, both of their lives when Jesus died. And I know there's deep theological argument and belief and all these things about Judas, but I've always come back to this thought and Peter. Both of them messed up. Both of them messed up. Jesus sold Judas sold Jesus for 30 coins and felt regret. Peter denied and felt regret. But the difference between Judas and Peter is Judas was convinced that Jesus could never forgive him. And Peter just gave Jesus enough time to come back and do so. Some of you, you just need to open up your life. You're type A, you have to have it all figured out all the time. You have so many questions, not enough answers. But a big aspect of faith is just saying, I'm tired. I want Jesus. I'm tired of living the way that I'm living. I'm tired of feeling lost. I'm tired of it being overwhelming. I'm tired of anxiety and fear dictating my life. I want Jesus. And the Bible says if you would just call on Jesus, that he'll begin a relationship with you, that you can trust in his love because he died on a cross for you, that you can trust in his future because he defeated death and hell when he rose from the dead that you can trust that he will never leave you or never forsake you and he will never give up on you and the bible says the way you begin a relationship with jesus is you call out to him you confess with your heart you believe in your mind that's it so here's my question both here in montgomeryville you need jesus today you tired ready to humble yourself in his sight you're overwhelmed 
life is literally falling apart and you don't know what to do, turn to Jesus. He'll be a present help in a time of need. He'll be a real love. He'll give you joy. He'll comfort you. He'll forgive you. He'll sit closer than a brother. He's here. You can feel him. He's real. He's knocking at the door of your heart. I'm going to let him in. If that's you all over this place, if you're in Montgomeryville, and as I'm speaking, you know I'm speaking to you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, and I'm not going to call you out, but I want to know I'm praying with you. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this moment, and you would say, hey, that's me. The emotion is running. The heart is beating fast. The Lord is speaking to me right now, and I don't have it all figured out, but I know that I'm tired, and I know I need Jesus. I want to pray with you as we close. Simple prayer. Here I am. Jesus, come into my life. I want you to remember this moment, November 7, 2021. So I want you to do one thing for me. It takes a little bit of courage, a little bit of stepping out of your comfort zone, and a little bit of desperation. That's where God meets us, when we're desperate. Jesus, I want you to come into my life right now and save me and set me free. If that's you all over this place, front to back, side to side, I'm speaking to you and you know it. In Montgomeryville and here, would you just begin to shoot your hand straight towards heaven and say, that's me. There's hands everywhere. Hand, 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 hand. Yeah, hand, yeah, yeah. Spirit of God is moving in this place, all over this place. All over this place. Is there anybody else say, hey, pastor, that's me. I'm tired right now. I missed that first one. I let fear get in the way. I let a little worry get in the way. I didn't think anybody else was going to raise their hand. But that's me. You're talking to me right now. And I want Jesus to come into my life right now. Right now in this moment. Is there anybody else? That, hey, Pastor, that, that's me. That's me. That's me. Let's begin to pray all over this place. Lord, we love you. And Father, we thank you for filling this place with your presence. You're good. You're loving. You're grace-filled. You're prison breaking presence Lord you're here and Jesus we don't have it all figured out but here's what we know we know we need you we know we want a relationship with you we know we're tired and weary and the Bible says to come to you and you'll give us rest for your yoke is easy and your burden is light and so we leave this place and we're a new person can't even explain it lord where we've been we've been uh, struggling with fear lord you've you've overwhelmed us with peace lord where we've been strangled with shame lord your hope is filling our life right now you're restoring what felt broken you're forgiven what felt like it would never be never be forgiven Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you for how you love us. Thank you for filling this room, Lord, both here in Montgomeryville. Thank you for those that are responding in Montgomeryville right now. Lord, even though they're not physically here with me in, in the room, Lord, they can feel the presence of God moving in that, in that place. And Lord, you're changing everything about them. Lord, we love you. And as we leave this place, Lord, what you've done here, we don't want to stay here. Lord, in a very practical way, with our eyes wide open, would you bring people into our path? Lord, that we can pour into. You've poured into us. We want to pour into other people, Lord. And Lord, we're thankful, Father, that the Bible says that if we try to hold on to our life, we lose it. But if we lose it for you, if we let go of it for you, there we find it. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, one more time, church. Let's shout amen together. Let's clap together all over our houses. Hey, before you go, we want you to know you are the reason we stream our service. If you joined us for your first or second time, fill out an online info card so we can meet you, answer any questions you might have, and help you get connected with a Journey Campus near you. Or if you gave your life to Jesus today, we would love to equip you with resources to help you with your new faith. If you don't live near a Journey Campus, we would love to connect you with a church in your area. Church Online is a great way for us to share our faith with our friends and learn about God's love. But we know nothing can replace being a part of your local church family. In fact, God calls us to come together to serve others, grow in our faith, and help introduce people to Jesus. So send us a message. We'd love to help you find a church near you. Have a great rest of your week. We look forward to seeing you soon.